Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Karen Wickett and I'm moderating this session. This is DCMI uh, 2022. And this session, this is a paper session, Metadata Models, Services and Ethics. Uh, we have uh, 90 minutes scheduled. So, and we have three papers uh, from Hugh Patterson III, from Michael Phillips, and Jeff Mixter, and then from Kylie Jo Lacour. So since we have third, uh, since we have 90 minutes all together, uh, and we, uh, I thought we could uh, have about 30 minutes for each paper. So that's um, 20 minutes uh, talking, and then we can have 10 minutes Q and A. Uh, so that's um, that's my plan. And speakers, I'll give you a five minute warning over chat when um, when we're five minutes away from your 20 minutes, right? Uh, so if that all sounds good, if there's any um, problems, you can uh, reach out to me by chat or to uh, Sunny, which is uh, the DCMI 2020 Sunny account here. That's another possibly more well-connected person to talk to for technical problems. Uh, so let's start out. I was just going to follow the order uh, that's in the program, unless anyone wants to switch real quick. But uh, I think we'll start with Hugh Patterson. Uh, Hugh Patterson has an MA in linguistics and has worked with SL, SIL's International Language and Cultural Archives for several years. He writes um, for broad audiences to people who may not be subject specialists, and he's looking to collaborate with institutions to make their language resources more discoverable. Uh, so, Hugh, are you ready? Uh, yes, and Sunny's gonna play it as a video. Okay. Hello, my name is Hugh Patterson, and I'm presenting today at the Dublin Core 2022 conference. And I'm presenting a paper titled An OLAC Perspective on Services, Forgotten Language Resources. Services, I say, are forgotten in this case because, well, in the OLAC OAI aggregator, there's no records for services. Uh, further, in the Dublin Core literature, there's not a whole lot of examples for uh, services description uh, using the DCMI type services. So today I, I explore those issues. Um, by way of uh, refresher, um, Dublin Core and the DCMI type uh, service, uh, or where do they fit? Um, so Dublin Core has several constituent components, uh, the Dublin Core elements, the Dublin Core terms, the DCMI type vocabulary, which is the um, part of, of the Dublin Core metadata standard that I'm going to be basing my conversation out of. Um, then there's the eight external vocabularies that Double Core can uh, can link to and use. Um, and then there's the 12 different syntaxes that are defined for very specific fields within the Dublin Core element or terms. So Dublin Core DCMI type uh, vocabulary has several options, um, services where uh, I'll be talking about, but then I'll contrast those with interactive resources and software a little bit during my talk. Of course, there are collections, data sets, events, and et cetera, through the other parts of the DCMI type vocabulary. Um, now, I talk about OLAC in the title, but uh, what is OLAC? Well, OLAC is a consortium or a, a group, I'd say a little bit less than a consortium, but um, uh, data providers that um, work with uh, language archives, or they steward language resources, they have awareness of language resources, and they provide data um, via the Dublin Core Metadata Standard, um, the OLAC vocabularies that modify the Dublin Core Metadata Standard, and they do that via OAI um, syntax. Uh, so the Dublin vocabularies, there's five um, that modify uh, various elements, so two that modify the type element, two that modify the subject element, um, and one of those can also be used to modify the language element. And then the role that also uh, does the Dublin Core, uh, modifies the Dublin Core 
contributor element. Um, so uh, how do they do that? Well, syntactically, they do that uh, through the XSI type uh, declaration uh, because it's an XML based on OAI. It's an XML um, uh, syntax. So uh, so that's kind of the, the nuts and bolts, the, the technical side of it. Um, but let's look more broadly at the, um, the context a little bit. So a uh, language resourcing resource indexing. So talking about discoverability and thinking about uh, discoverability when uh, community members of minority languages want to discover um, where resources are um, stewarded about their their language, where can they go? Also, when scholars uh, want to know more about their uh, particular research language, where can they go? Uh, so there are some commercial options that, that answer these questions. Um, there's the linguistic and language behavior abstracts. There's the linguistic bibliography, linguistic abstracts online. All of these resources have several hundred thousand um, individual resources indexed um, by language. Uh, in contrast to those commercial options, there's a scholar driven uh, community called the Glottolog with just under 500,000 um, entries. And in contrast to those resources, which are predominantly print media and also predominantly uh, scholarly publications, there are three networks of archives and stewards of language resources that are um, stewarding multimedia, multimedia resources. And so there's OLAC, there's Clarin, and there's MetaShare. And there's some overlap, but in general, they're, they're independent networks of archives. Uh, so Clarin and MetaShare both have their own independent schemas. Some elements of those schemas are describable or equivalent to Dublin Core uh, metadata elements. And so there is some crosswalk availability, um, some congruency. Um, in contrast to those two independent schemas, which sometimes don't uh, go, have a one-to-one -one correspondence with uh, things in, in Dublin Core, there is OLAC and it builds specific on Dublin Core. And so the OLAC community is the basis of my uh, discussion today. Um, talking about DCMI type service, well, uh, the two examples I found in the literature that talk about use cases where DCMI type service was used, one was uh, in relationship to the New Zealand government, and the other was in relationship to uh, scholarly resource discovery uh, service that was developed in the UK. And uh, they were advertising other servers where resources could be queried from using SOAP or web services. Broadly, though, speaking about service, I, th I think um, we should kind of give it some definition or kind of give it some some bearing in the, in the conversation. And the idea in general in services is that there's a client or a customer that uh, has something to offer to the service. The service does something with that. Uh, and then the client or customer receives something back from the service, uh, whether that's the same client as the, the giving client or a different client. Um, you know, those are some open-ended questions. Um, but if we're to look at a uh, service more holistically than just the, the very simple uh, view of it, we might have to answer some questions um, like what is the content type that's going in or what is the content type coming out of the service? Um, is there a data retention policy? And is the service manager the same as the service owner? Um, and in cases where language resources are, um, are involved, I see a clear distinction between the service itself and the service model. So if we take Google Translate, for instance, um, it's driven, the power of its it transformations on the data is driven by um, a neural network AI. Um, and in that case, the user interface where people would go to um, submit data and receive a, a response is independently managed from the computational side of things. So rather than talking about service model in terms of the business model, I'm talking about it in terms of the uh, operational technical models that drive that. And I, I'm su suggesting that those technical models could be independently described resources. Um, and in Dublin Core, we would relate those with a relation element. 
Um, you know, in the literature, there's also something about uh, libraries having a variety of services, and um, some of the more technical services are uh, harvesting, metadata generation, metadata augmentation, transformation, equivalence, crosswalking, archive persistence um, of data and annotation, metadata improvement and ratings, aggregation. Now, these are covered uh, in some detail in Phelps' uh, 2006 paper, um, and it's, I think, very useful to think about these because the, if we were to advertise these services, those would be a large variety of, of service records that could be available in the Dublin Core um, metadata schema if, if libraries were to advertise those. If, per, for instance, if we were to develop an aggregator of library services, right, where can you find something and you wanted to know which which institutional library had a service like that. Um, now, I think it's important to say that some things are not a service. Um, uh, I'm going to give a couple of examples from linguistics here, um, and I would suggest that these are interactive resources. Um, they're based off of um, persisted data or um, hosted data uh, in some cases, but uh, uh, this is Pangloss, and when a visitor goes here, they can listen to a audio and they can see the written transcription at the same time. And they have independent uh, resource identifiers. And this is a very similar vein, but this one also works with video um, and uh, has grammatical descriptions as well. This is a third case. Um, and in this case, the screen components can be adjusted. So the font size can be adjusted, the uh, text display size can be, and the speed of playback can be adjusted. So there's some interactivity here. Um, so when we look at service description, I think um, we can use some of the Dublin Core elements and the DCT, uh, Dublin Core um, terms to describe a service quite fully. Um, but I, I, I want to say that we should think about uh, service in contrast to other things that are possible in the DC, uh, DCMI types vocabulary. And to qualify as a service, it should do at least two things. Um, so uh, first, it receives data input and computes on the data and then outputs some or all of that data into some new structure format. So essentially, what's happening is the service is changing to qualify as a service it has to change the expression or the manifestation of the input second and to, it has to meet both definitions right the second is it allows for multiple inputs to the defined workflow in contrast to the presented criteria for services interaction resources um, or interactive resources act on a single set of input data and provide some sort of enhanced understanding on the basis that is of a single input. So interactive resource, I can call it an app, I can call it a web page, do lots of different uh, things, but it's got one one essence, one uh, one manifestation that is mutable in some way. Uh, it's it's good for one set of data, whereas a service, you can do this over and over and over again with different sets of data um, or different inputs. Um, so I think a good service record might have some things like a URL address, a description for the content in and out, and returned content to the same client or different client, data retention policy, a privacy policy, modality of materials that are acted upon. Um, we can use a lot of mark descriptors for uh, in the contributor roles, um, like uh, the service manager, service owner. Um, but for language resources, two of the important things that we need to know are the language of the user interface and the language of data processing. Um, and so there's only one language element. So this is where OLAC um, and the Open Language Archives community, if we're going to index services, um, would really uh, benefit from adding some additional clarification. 
overlap of services and language resources. This is a, a Euler diagram. And if we had all language resources that we knew about in the gray, I'm suggesting that the purple would be a class of all possible services and that there's some overlap. And if we knew of all yellow being all of the uh, index language resources, well, um, it would have some overlap with the purple. And if all the ones that are available in, in, in the green, only about 65 percent of the ones uh, in OLAC are really uh, have an identifiable language associated with them. Uh, this is related to practices of indexing and curation at the data providers. Um, some example of services that I've seen in uh, as a linguist and as a scholar, I'm Reflex uh, is, allows people to compare dictionaries for historical linguistic analysis, uh, allows the person to engage with the data in different in a variety of ways and create hypotheses and document those hypotheses and then export the data. Um, ASR is a um, you know automatic speech recognition, uh, speech to text uh, would fall into that category, and then Google Translate, which I talked about earlier. Now, I think the an important part in the, in the written paper that accompanies this presentation, I talk about this in a little bit more detail, but uh, approaching the modality of the service is important. So by modality, are we talking about a service that acts on, on artifacts that are audio in nature or are textual in nature or are video in nature even? So um, a script is another important point. Uh, BCP 47 allows us to sometimes uh, specify the script. So ENGB would be uh, British spelling of English versus the US spelling of English. Um, and, and it could operate at the level of the glyphs used in the case of uh, uh, Chinese and used in China and Chinese used in uh, Taiwan. Um, but it gets harder to identify if the service is a as speech to text service or a text to text translation service. So I appreciate um, you listening to this talk and I anticipate your questions. And uh, of course you can contact me even outside of the conference. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Hugh. Uh, and Hugh is here so we can ask questions. Uh, and let's give a round of applause. Thank you for uh, starting us off with this talk. We'll continue to be here, I think, in the chat, so you can send them further questions over the chat or by email. And so next, I think we'll move it on to uh, OCLC's model in WorldCat, a focus on relationships from Michael Phillips and Jeff Mixter and Catherine Stein. Uh, so Michael Phillips is at OCLC. His work focuses on linked data, ontologies, taxonomies, and bibliographic conceptual models. He recently began serving as OCLC liaison to the ALA for Subject Access Committee. Uh, so, um, and Mike, I think you should be enabled to share your screen if you're Let me ready. go ahead and... Everyone see that all right? Yep, looks good. Okay, excellent. Well, happy to be here today, uh, speaking with everybody, providing uh, something of a, a status update on a, or a work in progress report on the continuing development of uh, the WorldCat ontology model um, in order to deal with the, the bibliographic data in WorldCat as well as some of the authority and uh, subject data that's uh, managed by OCLC. With me today is a uh, paper co-author, Jeff Mixter, who will be uh, available to answer questions during the Q&A phase. And then we'd also like to recognize the contributions in developing this paper of uh, Catherine Stein, who uh, unfortunately for us is no longer with uh, OCLC. So to, to kick it off, uh, I'd like to just do a quick background on the development of various conceptual bibliographic models over the past 20 years or so uh, that kind of form the backdrop of the, the current modeling activities at OCLC. 
starting with the library reference model, uh, many of you I'm sure are familiar with. Uh, the LRM model proposes the hierarchical WEMI structure uh, that is works, expressions, manifestations, and items. So a, a work is realized through an expression, an expression is embodied in a manifestation, and a manifestation is exemplified by an item. And in that way, the WEMI model moves hierarchically from the most abstract notion of a creative endeavor at the, the work entity level to that which is the most tangible, uh, that is to say an item or a physical or digital resource that can be accessed by a user. And importantly, RDA has adopted the LRM WEMI model uh, as its conceptual model. So it has been embedded in the, the library community for some time now. However, there are some challenges in adapting WEMI to a MARC bibliographic database, and that's shown the diagram on the right. Um, one of the, the primary challenges here is that the data in MARC records, uh, tip, it's typically aligned to what would be considered a, a WEMI manifestation entity, meaning that the more abstract works and expression entities have to be derived from uh, that MARC record. And while this hierarchical structure tends to work quite well for bibliographic resources that have many derivatives and publications and republications, some resources do not benefit from the imposed abstraction of the model. Uh, and for, for example, a, a photograph in a digital repository, it's a simple resource for a user to understand but the model forces the creation of four separate entities that really only differ in their degree of specificity. And this may seem unnecessarily redundant to the user. So in response, the uh, Library of Congress has proposed uh, the bib frame model. Uh, that model there is on the right with the LRM model from the previous slide by comparison on the left. Uh, Bibframe takes a slightly different approach to the hierarchy proposed by LRM, uh, whereby the Bibframe work entity is situated at, at what would be a, a WEMI expression level entity. And it forgoes the, the fully abstract notion of the WEMI work. And the goal of Bibframe is to allow for a single mark record to be transformed into to RDF. Yet, however, like without this higher level WEMI work entity, uh, aggregating all the derivatives of a given resource can be a challenge. And so in response to this, BibFrame has introduced the notion of a hub, which demonstrates the utility in having an abstract representation of a bibliographic entity that can act as an aggregator for all the derivatives of a work. But it should be noted that the hub is not an entity class in the same way as a WEMI work is. It's just a method of aggregation. And additionally, BibFrame does not attempt to model semantic relationships between works. And this is an area where OCLC is adding to the community dialogue. And I'll, I will speak to that a little bit more later. First, I'd like to speak a little bit about uh, Ferber clusters at OCLC. And so this gets to the question of uh, aggregation and the best way to do that, aggregating derivatives of, of uh, like entities, like works. So Ferber clusters were an early effort by OCLC to gather like records through algorithmic analysis, whereby each record uh, was assigned an ID that was unique to the cluster. And so the clusters provided logical record groupings, but they didn't describe any of the semantic relationships between the records in that group. And so they approximate the aggregation intent of the WEMI work in the BibFrame hub. And this is why OCLC uh, early on explored using clusters as the basis for establishing what would be uh, WEMI work entities. But there were two major challenges with this. The first being simply that Ferber clusters weren't perfect, aren't perfect. Uh, WorldCAD data joins from thousands of sources, and so differences in cataloging practices and even just simple human errors can prevent the clustering algorithms from achieving a 100% accuracy. And then additionally, there's the issue of end user display. 
So a search based on a cluster derived work could yield too many results, potentially hundreds or even thousands. That's based on the number of records in, a, in the cluster. And they would be lacking sufficient semantic relationships between them. So a user would end up uh, being required to sift through many, many irrelevant and seemingly redundant works without really a clear sense of how they relate to one another. So that review of the community modeling uh, over the past 20 years or so, along with the Ferber clusters, leads us to an introduction of the current modeling that is in uh, progress at OCLC. Uh, it should be noted that the, the modeling work presented here is not the same as that which is currently impl implemented in WorldCat entities. And so some of you may be aware that OCLC recently made public uh, WorldCat entities at id.oclc.org, which is a linked data entity management service containing over 150 million works in person entities. The ontology model used in WorldCat entities was purposefully limited in scope in order to meet the realistic project timelines. So what's important to know is that the modeling work that's discussed here is both a revision to a limited extent and to a much greater extent, an extension of the existing model. Uh, and it is intended to provide the basis for future li linked data initiatives at OCLC. And so since bibliographic data is kind of our bread and butter here, we'll start uh, focused on the, the world cat work. So due in part to the difficulties in generating WEMI works from Ferber clusters, OCLC is proposing the notion of a world cat work, which like BibFrame is equivalent to what would be considered a, a WEMI expression. And I'm gonna be really careful as we move forward to emphasize world cat work versus a WEMI work just to avoid any uh, confusion. So world cat work entities include specific properties that are useful to end users, uh, such as the language or the type of resource that is a, a text or audio or image, et cetera. Uh, and this, it, these details uh, distinguish them more from the, the abstract WEMI work entity. But perhaps most importantly, it's the relationships that are critical to understanding the structured connections between bibliographic entities and other types of entities, uh, such as agents, for example. And so there are a few areas where we've focused a lot of attention, one being properties that contextualize relationships to agents. And to, to that end, we've developed a rich variety of agent roles that are intended to fully capture the creative contributions of agents associated with the WorldCat work. And it's the specificity of these semantic relationships that's especially important for differentiating multiple creators. For example, the author of a WorldCat work versus the illustrator. Additionally, we focused a lot of attention on properties that contextualize relationships to other works. Uh, some examples, sequel or prequel, uh, based on kind of adaptation relationship, a translation relationship. And these are designed to situate the WorldCat work in the larger creative ecosystem in which it exists. And this is a powerful tool for traversing the, the intricate connections between derivative WorldCat works. So what's most important here is that in contrast to WEMI, the OCLC model de-emphasizes the hierarchical relationships and instead focuses on relationships that describe transformations and connections between derivatives. However, since the OCLC model foregoes that fully abstract WEMI notion of the work, there is still a question of how best to aggregate related WorldCat works. So the representative WorldCat work is proposed instead to act as a common connection between entities uh, to fulfill that aggregation purpose. Uh, this is similar to the BibFrame notion of a, a hub. So the representative WorldCat work is not an entity type in and of itself. Instead, it's the WorldCat work identified as the logical center of the graph to which all its derivative WorldCat works can connect whether directly or indirectly. And so this slide shows the first publication of The Adventures of Tom Sawyer by Mark Twain in 1876, because 
the representative world cat work is currently defined as the very first instantiation of a creative endeavor or that which is considered the canonical version of that resource. Now, this is an area where policies and best practices for identifying the representative world cat work are still in development. And it's probably an area where we'll be reaching out uh, to for larger community engagement in order to help answer some of these complex questions. Because while well, the first instantiation is a, a simple determination for world cat works with explicit initial publications, namely those in the modern era, uh, but it becomes much less clear when dealing with books that have pre-modern origins, uh, such as the Iliad or Beowulf. And this is where the idea of a, a canonical version comes into play. But this also introduces a, a level of subjectivity uh, that can be quite difficult to deal with. An, another interesting example of this is uh, that of the Ridley Scott film Blade Runner, uh, which saw a theatrical release in 1982, and then there was a director's cut in 1992, and then a final director's cut in 2007. And so while we know uh, the first instantiation, we, we know that, that that's clear, we have to ask ourselves which version is considered the definitive version that best captures the artist's true intent. So more on this to come as we kind of work through these complex questions. So building off of the WorldCat work, we're also proposing the notion of a WorldCat edition entity. Um, and this would be equivalent to what would be considered a WEMI manifestation. So the properties related to a WorldCat edition would be those that detail the publication and manufacture um, into a physical or digital resource. However, at this time, the entity model is still under development, so full details aren't yet available. So I'm gonna zoom out here and show this diagram, which is a limited view of the graph structure based on the model with the adventures of Tom Sawyer again as example. Uh, of course, for a work like that, the, the graph would actually be substantially larger. This is just an example. And it, don't worry, you don't have to, to read all of the, the small print here. This is just a visual anchor for the next slides where I'll show some, uh, some examples. So here we have a based on example, which is shows this relationship between the representative world cat work and a derivative film adaptation. And it's this based on relationship. And it's the emphasis on these meaningful relationships that allows the model to express how derivative works relate to one another and directly or indirectly relate back to the representative world cat work. And in this way, like entities can be aggregated using those relationships rather than these increasingly uh, uh, abstract classes. So this next example shows a work-to-work -work relationship. So we see a reading of relationship between the Norwegian translation of Tom Sawyer, published as a text in 1949, and the audio recording of that translation created in 2003. And here we see a WorldCat work that is itself a derivative of another WorldCat work, yet still indirectly relating back to the representative WorldCat work. And without the specificity of these properties uh, describing the transformations taking place here, uh, these relationships could appear anomalous or at the very least quite ambiguous. So, by providing meaningful relationships between WorldCat entities, the OCLC model aims to support a discovery focused knowledge graph that can be used by library systems and services, as well as by general purpose web services to improve the searchability and contextualization of library materials. And here we're zooming back out again to the full example with a representative WorldCat work at the center of the graph and then the derivative world cat works branching off from it, uh, each with their own world cat edition or additions. And again, you don't have to worry about reading all of the small, small text in this diagram. Uh, this graph, it will be published with the conference paper, though it's been rearranged a little bit to uh, have a more of a, a vertical orientation uh, for that format, but all of the entities are, and details are the same. So 
So uh, in order to wrap up the, uh, this presentation, since this is a report on a work in progress, um, I'm gonna present some of the updates on the modeling work since the initial submission of the conference paper. So currently entity models have been developed for persons, works, places, and organizations. The addition model is in development at the moment and future entity models will include events, items, concepts, in modeling WorldCat works, we have given significant attention to certain bibliographic entities with specific and, and complex needs. And one example of this, uh, continuing and integrating resources uh, such as journals and multi-part monographs, which have uh, these complicated whole to part relationships and they experience name changes and mergers with other resources over the, the resources lifespan. Another example is that of music, which also has complex hold apart relationships. And that modeling work has also raised some additional and intriguing questions about the relationships between WorldCat works and events that are captured by that work. Uh, so think of uh, the recording of a, a concert or, or of a stage production. But since the event model is not yet complete, those questions cannot be fully answered at this time. But it is an interesting example of how the interdependencies between these entity models make the development process so complex. We do consider the modeling entities well beyond just simple bibliographic data as critical to enriching that bibliographic data, as well as rounding out a, a general purpose ontology for future knowledge work in libraries and other institutions. And with that, thank you very much. And we'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, applause. Thank you. Uh, so Ellie is, a, is the metadata strategies librarian at, in the Department of Digital Stewardship at Syracuse University Libraries. Uh, and she's currently a fellow with the Drexel University Metadata Research Center's leading program. Uh, so Kylie, take it away. Thank you so much. Um, my paper was actually a short paper discussing a work in progress, um, but I will happily talk for a couple extra minutes if we have the time. Um, let me just get started here. Okay. So before I begin, I just want to acknowledge I'm currently in Syracuse, New York. I work for Syracuse University, and I just want to acknowledge with respect the Onondaga Nation, the fire keepers of the Haudenosaunee, who are the indigenous peoples on whose ancestral land Syracuse University and indeed the city of Syracuse now stands. And before I start with the full discussion, I just want to give a note on language. So throughout the presentation, I'll be using language that may not be preferred terms by communities today. And in many cases, the language I'll be using is in fact harmful. Um, we'll examine certain cases where the decision behind why that language was incorporated into the metadata is detailed, but there may be terms that come up in the presentation or in the Q&A um, that are historically significant, but don't align with modern community preferred language. One of the most frequent terms that's going to come up um, is that of freak. And I just want to address that first before we start. Um, freak shows were a very specific type of entertainment. They were often part of or associated with dime museums, sideshows, et cetera, other types of um, entertainment of that kind. But the freak shows themselves were specifically those that involved performers with visually obvious physical differences. Um, I refer to physical differences rather than disabilities because the concept of disability has, of course, changed over time. Um, and it has different cultural meaning today than it did for these performers. Also because the differences also extended to those such as darker skin tones than those of the white audience members. Um, unfortunately, because of time constraints, I won't be discussing um, the attributes of race in these photographs, um, which is a very important discussion to have, but just not one that we have time for today. Um, the term freak and freak shows will be used because there is no synonym that can represent them instead. And we'll talk a lot more about, about synonyms as we move forward. 
So as an introduction to the collection that I'm going to be talking about, uh, the Ronald G. Becker Collection of Charles Eisenman Photographs is held by Syracuse University Library's Special Collections Research Center. Um, it was donated to the libraries in 1985, and the majority of the collection is comprised of carte de visite and cabinet cards from the late 19th century, although there are some that are later as well. Um, many, many of these are studio portraits of so-called freak performers. The full collection of slightly over 1400 items was digitized by a vendor in 2005. Uh, the metadata provenance is largely unknown. Uh, we don't seem to have any extant information about what descriptive information was actually created by the vendor and what was created by the libraries. We're still investigating this to see if we can kind of unearth anything from that period. Um, but either way, we have to own the likelihood that the problematic descriptive information was created at the libraries. And either way, it's our responsibility to steward it and remediate it when necessary. So this collection was part of our first phase of collections that were identified for migration onto our new digital asset management system, Cortex. Um, when I started migrating this, I hadn't planned to do any remediation of it, um, but it was immediately apparent uh, when I started to transform the metadata to suit the new application profile before I actually ingested it into the new system. But there were really significant and severe problems, not only with the quality of the metadata, but also with its content. Uh, so the content is what we're going to be discussing. Uh, first, though, to kind of act as a segue, uh, an extremely, extremely brief introduction to care ethics at the very highest level. Uh, as with any branch of scholarship, it's really impossible to do justice to the details of a field from a kind of 30,000 foot view. Um, but that being said, I focused specifically on the words of some notable scholars who can help us build an understanding um, of some of the most applicable points. So care ethics originated in feminist ethics in the 1980s. Um, notably with the very famous uh, book in a different voice by Carol Gilligan, um, but as such, there's no such thing as a exact starting point um, for any kind of scholarship. So there was work being done before that, and of course, after that, unconnected. Um, Virginia Held helpfully defines care ethics for us as, quote, both a practice and a value. A practice because it, quote, shows us how to respond to needs and why we should, and a value because, quote, caring relations ought to be cultivated between persons in their personal lives and between members of caring societies. Stephanie Collins, uh, in her book that kind of surveys the basic tenets of care ethics across a lot of different scholars, um, describes these relationships and how their, quote, responsibilities derive directly from relationships between particular people rather than from abstract rules and principles. And something that will definitely ring a bell for anyone who has um, any kind of background in ethics is the fact that abstract rules and principles are a big deal in ethics, and they're the foundation of a lot of ethical thought. Um, care ethics takes a different approach. So Michelle Caswell and Marika Sephor really anchor an approach to archival work uh, in care ethics, arguing that, quote, a feminist ethics of care approach places the archivist in a web of relationships with each of the concerned parties and posits the archivist has an effective responsibility to responsibly empathize with each of the stakeholders. And they describe this type of empathy as, quote, radical empathy. And it's kind of a, a new way of stating an idea that had been around for a while. Um, Nell Noddings in the 1980s describes uh, the same uh, concept really as quote, the fundamental aspect of caring from the inside, which is quote, a displacement of interest from my own reality to the reality of the other. So what does this mean for us? Um, Using the Sideshow Performers Collection as an example, um, we can see how care ethics can be actively applied um, in a real project. And just as a note, sometimes I refer to an application of care ethics sometimes as a caring approach. I consider these just two different ways of stating the same concept and practice, so I'm not creating any delineation between those two. Responsibility for my own work and its shortcomings is obviously a basic professional responsibility, um, even before applying a caring approach, but further than that, a caring approach really starts with my responsibility for creating a relationship with each person represented, like we just saw. So any active application of care ethics means that to construct that relationship with the person who's represented in the material I'm stewarding, I must respect their identity. 
So in this collection specifically, part of that means that I need to center the names of the performers. So instead of allowing original descriptions um, to include names in the transcribed text, um, rather than the created description, I prioritize performers' names at the beginning of the created description as well. Um, also using the term unidentified when necessary to indicate that a person's name is unknown. So acting kind of not as a placeholder necessarily, but kind of as a, a marker that this person's name is not known. Um, I also contextualize stage names as a performance rather than an actual identifying name. Um, and the performed roles themselves are described as performances. Um, I also drew attention to photo composition, costuming, props, etc. Uh, everything that was used to visually create the role the performer is performing in the image. Um, I think this is a good time to point out that the reason I chose not to actually include any examples of the photographs in this presentation um, was because they are necessarily voyeuristic. And I think that argument can definitely be made of any archival content, um, but especially because of the nature of these photographs. Um, a lot of them are very, um, um, what is the word I'm looking for? They, they expose the performers in a way that um, is not typical of more casual types of photography. And we'll talk about this also in a moment. Um, I use preferred terms um, from the performers where known, which of course, this is not necessarily something that is known in a lot of cases um, because of the slight uh, historical gap between us and the subjects of the photographs. Um, but I used these even when it doesn't align with current community preferred language. So as an example of this, um, little people who performed as midgets specifically preferred the term midget. Um, so not only is it historically significant as a word that defines their performed role, but it was also what they wanted to be called. It was a way that they demarked themselves from other performers. This is very much at odds with language that little people prefer today and is in, in fact an extremely pejorative term and it should never be used to refer to someone. So in light of that, let's take an example, um, take a look at an example of what this can look like. So the description of the le legacy metadata read, quote, woman standing next to table. That's firstly not a particularly helpful description. Um, and it was remediated to full view of Lavinia Warren. We did know that it was Lavinia Warren. She's very, very famous. Um, and her name was included in the transcribed text. So I went ahead, moved that to the front of the description. Uh, then a white woman who performed as a midget, so therefore um, contextualizing that performance with the term that she preferred, um, standing next to a table. So again, kind of incorporating a little bit of visual description here. The top half of the image is negative space to emphasize her height. This was an extremely typical uh, method of composing the photograph, um, where little people performing as midgets were uh, either positioned very far away from the camera um, or fairly far away from the camera. Typically they were, they were not close. Um, and the top half of the image or top third um, was left as negative space to make them appear smaller. So this information helps the user who may not be very familiar with the composition of these photos and the methods that were used to create these performances understand what they're looking at in greater detail. Discussing these performed roles really allows us to mitigate harm as much as possible while providing necessary historical context. Obviously, we would love to mitigate all of the harm, if at all possible, um, but unfortunately, we have to pay due attention to both mitigation of harm and historical context. It's not an either or situation. Um, it has to be a both and situation. So this is particularly important in this collection as freak photography was a specific influence on the rise of medical photography, um, which also appears in this collection and a few objects, not too many, but it's, it's, it is present. Um, and because it influenced medical photography, it also influenced the eugenics movement in the United States and Western Europe. Obviously this has had enormous impact to say that lightly, um, on the understanding of disability and the treatment of disabled people. So not recognizing historical context does these performers and ourselves and disabled people in our contemporary society a incredible disservice. 
um, we can't erase that harm that's already been done, but we should be mindful at all times of not perpetuating further harm while still recognizing its historical and present existence. This approach extends to other fields as well, uh, including the need to remove uncontextualized harmful language from the titles of the image. Um, in particular, because these, of course, in a digital collection are the primary way that users choose their objects to view um, and also to the name of the collection. So the archival collection is the Ronald G. Becker collection of Charles Eisenman photographs. This for the digital collection was changed to the Sideshow Performers Collection. Um, our digital collections, of course, are not always a one-to-one -one relationship with archival collections. So our digital collections do not always have the same name as archival collections. Um, we have other, uh, multiple other ways that we represent the relationship between them. Um, so each object is visibly linked to um, a label that identifies it as being from the archival collection and a link to the finding aid uh, is also included in the metadata. Um, in the description of the collection, when the user first clicks on it, it opens a landing page and also states that relationship between the two. That decision to change the name um, was made, even though in this case it is a one-to-one -one collection, because we wanted to emphasize the performer's contributions um, to the, the crafting of these roles that are, are being performed in the images. And also the fact that Charles Eisenman and his successor, Frank Wen, only created about a third of the images. The rest were created by um, a myriad of other photographers around the United States and Western Europe, um, some of whom were very famous, some of whom were lesser known um, and operated on a more local scale and took photos of the performers as they traveled around the United States or Western Europe. Um, another way of applying care ethics to the metadata is in the topics names field. So we have three different topics field um, in our application profile, which includes uh, subjects, geographic locations, and then of course names. So the names field allows us to provide a controlled vocabulary list that enables users to be able to narrow down their search results so they can see results with certain people identified in them. Um, respecting the identity of people in this collection means that we respect their personal identity, not their stage persona, however important it may or may not have been to them. This is obviously very much complicated by the fact that it privileges identified performers over unidentified performers and raises questions of how to proceed when people's names are unknown, but their stage names are known. So my argument um, from a caring approach is that the relationship that we're constructing with these people that are uh, depicted can help us make these decisions. Um, for instance, our collection has many white American women uh, who performed as Circassian characters and their characters' names are often printed on the cards or recorded on the verso. Um, so these are fictionalized, exoticized names such as Zuluma Agra or Zoe Maleke. Um, they often contain a Z, which is one of the ways that you can identify them. Um, but these names are not dehumanizing and their uh, characters were not dehumanizing. Um, on the other hand, you have performers such as William Henry Johnson, who was a Black man believed to have had microcephaly. So for many years, Johnson performed as the character Zip, which was a performance in which he dressed in a fur suit and incorporated animal behaviors into his act. So this is, on the face of it, obviously very dehumanizing, um, but especially so given that scholarship suggests that Johnson was actually either sold or rented into P.T. Barnum's ownership. Um, Johnson appears in the Library of Congress name authority file as Zip, but this is referring to his character, not to Johnson, um, who appeared in other roles as well. For this reason, I included Johnson, um, I included Johnson's name um, in the names field as William Henry Johnson, um, not as Zip, even though I generally follow the guidelines of the uh, name authority file and BF. Um, other performers with unknown names associated with similarly dehumanizing characters are not included in the names field. For the Circassian performers, uh, especially as several of them can be found in a number of cards in the collection and would thus benefit users by including their names in the names field, um, I did include their character names in that field, but contextualized them as performed characters as I would with other performances in the description itself. So. The approach is different for each of these because I am creating a relationship between myself and the performers um, to guide me in, in making these decisions. So in closing, to reiterate, there's no such thing as a one-size-fits-all approach. Our 
process for approaching the remediation and creation, whether that be the first creation of new metadata or the creation of that remediated metadata, um, is it's just as important as the result because it's informing that result. It's informing what we we are creating. Employing a caring approach helps us create these relationships with the people depicted in the materials that we're describing, and thus allows us to create better descriptions. Hey, thank you very much. Applause, applause. Very interesting. Thank all our speakers and give another round of applause. Uh, and thank you all as an audience for your excellent questions and participation. And everyone have a great rest of your conference and a great rest of your day. Bye. Yes, thank you.